again, everyone. Pastor Brad joining with Pastor Randy to welcome you back to another issue of spiritual honesty. We're glad you could be with us because we're going to talk about something really important. But before we get into that, let me ask you, um, how long have you been married? <sighs> you had to stop and count. 40, didn't you? Four, four years. years. Four years. Mm-hmm. And I've been married 32 years. Oh. Now, we've been married to each other, right? We're married to oh, yeah, yeah, other yeah. people. Oh, right? yes. yes. So that what's that? 44 and 32, that's 76 years of marriage mm-hmm. between us. So mm-hmm. maybe we know a little bit something uh, on the topic. Bit. On the topic. Well, that's what we're mm-hmm. talking about today. Um, one of the ideas of spiritual honesty, of course, is to encourage more honesty in mm-hmm. our faith walk. And sometimes marriages can get bogged down with a lot of trust issues and communication Mm -hmm. issues. And sometimes it's really hard to come to a good place in a marriage. So Mm -hmm. that's what we want to think about. And that's what we want to talk a little bit about uh, today, starting with this. For whatever reasons, fewer people are headed to the church and walking down the aisle to get married. The marriage rate in the U.S. has hit a 100-year low. There are lots of reasons for this, of course, including financial and cultural. But there also may be a more basic reason. Many people don't know how to love someone else, at least in the way that will produce a long and healthy marriage. A relationship starts with attraction. It moves toward arousal. There's excitement. There's anticipation. There's desire that continues to draw us into a relationship. It, it moves into infatuation. And infatuation says, I love how I feel about me when I am with you. That's all about self. That's not about the other person at all. At one time, Gary Nichols wanted to be a movie star and then a famous journalist. He decided instead that God could use him best in couples counseling and has worked for the past 40 years to combine the best of theological and psychological practice. Love is the subject of of great art and literature. It is the strongest motivating factor in life. And most people do not know how to love well. So to answer your question, I think the bedrock truth, the foundation, and fundamental truth that we try to teach people is what does it look like to love another person well? Nichols says there is a lot of misunderstanding about what the Bible teaches on marriage. For example, in Ephesians 5, we read that wives should submit to their husbands that can cause a lot of problems, especially if taken out of context. It's essential to read the entire section, especially verse 25, where husbands are told to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. I teach that in marriage, uh, this, this submission is mutual. And the way I describe it is this. To submit means to place oneself under literally, to place oneself under. Now, in our 21st century Western mindset, when we do this and we place ourselves under, our eyes go to that which is on top, that which tends to overshadow or dominate or suppress. But that's not what submission is about. Draw your attention to what is below it, what is under it, because it is not that which is on top that is oppressing that which is on the bottom. That which is on the bottom is establishing and supporting and uplifting and undergirding that which is above it. Too many marriages are built on false ideas about love. Couples think that the infatuation and arousal will last throughout the relationship, and when it fades, so can the marriage. Love, the true agape love of the Bible, is the foundation upon which all solid marriages are built. Love is the the ultimate power in the universe. It is the uh, nature and character of God. 
boy, I almost forgot our verse today. I got so excited to get into that. Uh-huh. I completely forgot about introducing our verse. Oh. Related to marriage. Oh, uh-huh. Ephesians 5.22. Mm-hmm. You know this one, right? Wives, submit to your husbands mm-hmm. as you do the Lord. That has caused mm-hmm. a lot mm-hmm. of problems and controversies <laughs> oh, yeah. in marriage, especially uh-huh. today. In the Me Too movement and mm-hmm. the women's empowerment movement, mm-hmm. a lot of women look at that verse and say, now, wait a minute. Mm-hmm. Does it say husbands have to mm-hmm. obey their wives? Mm-hmm. It says wives, right. submit to your husbands. A lot of women have gone so far as to take that out. Oh, yes. Out of the vows. Of the wedding yeah, vows. Absolutely. So what do you think about that? Oh, I've had uh, brides ask me. Um, can we take that part out? And when I sit and explain it to them, what it actually means, uh, they change their mind. Really? Yeah, because actually it's it doesn't say husbands submit to your wives. It says wives submit to your husbands as husbands are to submit to Christ. And it's this uh, focus back on Jesus. You know, as each of us is to focus in on him and do what he tells us. And then, so husbands, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to uh, sacrifice for your wife just as Christ sacrificed for the church. And that's the verse people never get to. They focus in on 522, but it says very clearly in 525 that husbands are to love their wives Mm -hmm. as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So if the wife knows that the husband Mm -hmm. loves her in that sacrificial Mm -hmm. way and understands that and the husband truly does love her in that way, she Mm -hmm. is much more willing to be able to submit Mm -hmm. in certain Mm -hmm. areas. Because let's face it, Mm -hmm. a marriage, in a very realistic sense, cannot be a democracy. People like to think of it as an Mm -hmm. equal partnership, Mm -hmm. but if you think of it as a democracy, well, you got one vote here and one vote here, it's always Mm -hmm. a tie. Mm -hmm. So who breaks the tie? Mm -hmm. If the husband is sacrificing his self and his interests and his his life Mm -hmm. for the wife, she is much more willing to let him then be the Mm tiebreaker. You know what I also love in this discussion is uh, from Ecclesiastes 4.12, which is the cord of three strands, Mm -hmm. where it talks about Mm -hmm. one can be overpowered, two can work together, but a cord of three strands cannot easily be broken. Mm -hmm. I love that imagery Mm -hmm. because that third strand is who? Uh, Jesus. Yeah. Absolutely. And he should be at the head of Mm -hmm. not just Mm -hmm. the marriage relationship, but of every relationship. Absolutely. If you have Jesus as that third strand then, Mm -hmm. and Jesus is the head of the relationship, it works in a faith sense, and Mm -hmm. you can have a happy and productive marriage. Absolutely. Now, on that subject, we want to meet a couple now who went through some difficulty and went through some difficult times, but because Jesus was that third Mm -hmm. strand, they are still together Yep. and have worked through and are still working through a lot of their issues. And let's go ahead and meet them now. Yeah, I was uh, separated from my, my, my wife and going through a divorce. And uh, I, I know she had come into where I was working there several times and had ordered food and just kind of kind of stuck around. And well, it's, I don't know, she seemed to, to want to be there at the restaurant where I was working. So. Is that the way you remember it? Uh, yeah. Um, like he said, uh, my stepbrother and his sister had been really good friends for uh, quite a while. And then um, there, <laughs> the day before I, um, or the, the night before I had started college, um, I had been, I had gone to, at, at the time it was his house, his sister was living with him at the time. Um, so I had gone over there for her to do my hair that night. Um, and I was just going to sleep in it and wear it to my college orientation that next day. And I'm sitting in his living room and he was at work and something just told me, you know, I, it's like he had said, I had gone into his work and, you know, had done that little flirty thing, but without being real forward about it. And 
So then something had just told me, like, just reach out to him. And I remember sitting there, and I was actually, I had my phone, and I was kind of trying to hold it, like, close to me because his sister was behind me doing my hair, and I didn't want her to know that I was messaging him. And uh, I just sent him a message, and all it said was, you should text me sometime. And I sent him my number, and he did. And then um, he ended up having me go to where he worked that night um, after he got off and we ended up sitting outside at some of the outside tables and I, we were sitting out there and we had just talked for like three hours just talking um, and then I mean we were pretty pretty inseparable from that point on. Had you both been married before? I had not. You had not but you had. I had. What made you think that this one was going to be different? I don't even think that, that was a thought. There was something different from the beginning, like she said. Um, uh, we ended up talking that evening outside at one of, at one of the outside dining tables. And we talked for hours into the evening, and I, I don't think I've ever been given the opportunity to think that it was going to be anything at all. It's just kind of always been. We had a great time talking, enjoying each other's company, and it was like we had been best friends for years already at first meeting each other or you know, first spending that time together and we've never stopped doing that. Now you had kids? I did. From, from a previous marriage then. Was that difficult in terms of bringing everybody together? No. Uh, in my opinion, yeah, Tierra I, I miraculously took on a role of being a mother for those two children and to this day, they still hold her very high as a mother figure. And um, you would think that she had been a mother before. She, she did a great job and always has done a great job raising them. And how many do you have together then? We have three together and then we have two from the previous marriage. Okay. So we have five that look up to her as a mother. Okay. A lot of chaos though. Yeah. Always. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about some of the challenges of your marriage because I know there have been many. Yes. What have been some of those specific challenges and how have you tried to overcome them? Uh, Tierra and I are seven years apart in age and I feel strongly that there's a there's a big difference in our upbringings and I mean just with the age difference alone we happen to fall on what I would call different sides of generations and I feel strongly in a lot of different ways, and she feels strongly in opposite ways. So there has been a, a lot of times where we had to meet in the middle, or we would not meet in the middle and deal <laughs> with the, that, that conflict. Were you both Christians when you came into the marriage? That's a hard question. <laughs> I, I think maybe we were both potential Christians, but maybe not fully understood or we hadn't committed to it I don't believe so I am um, I I grew up um, Christian I went to church um, with my grandparents until my grandmother passed away and then we just kind of stopped going um, and when that happened I didn't push myself um, to continue with my faith so kind of like he said like I wasn't wasn't very deep into it um, until you know, later on down the road, I guess. What difference has that faith made in your marriage? Your growing faith, I guess. Uh, it's made all the difference. Yeah, absolutely. It's made all the difference. In what way? Um, I mean, I'll, almost any way you could imagine. Um, we have found just living day to day with each other, having that faith gives us so much strength and so much willingness to accept things in ways that we never would have before. Um, and that's just because we have that faith now. Would you find it difficult to be married to someone who didn't share your faith? Absolutely. Yeah. So you're building up and helping each other, but that would be a lot harder if one of the parties was not as interested in the other Absolutely. in exploring their faith. Absolutely. I feel like the faith has given us a new foundation. Fortunately, we've had the opportunity to take several steps back and re 
rebuild and work on that foundation that before was a little rocky. You know, I think we, we built, we, we began building a foundation as potential Christians who really didn't live the day to day with much faith and with that opportunity to take those steps back and really give that foundation a reworking. Um, yeah, that's, I think that's really benefited us and it's going to continue to benefit our family moving on. Do you feel comfortable talking about the rocky parts? I, I think the whole point of this is how with Jesus as the foundation in a marriage, mm -hmm. it can help you get through those difficult times which otherwise might sink a marriage. So for me, since we have grown in our faith individually and together, I feel like it has given us something to lean on more than just ourselves. So, you know, before I would say we were both very selfish in areas that now, rather than being selfish, we lean more towards God and, you know, trust that, that his will is, you know, all that we need rather than our selfish will and what we want and desire. How long have you been married? Eight years. <laughs> She on, says, on looking at her watch. <laughs> I, I, the, the ninth is our wedding anniversary. Oh, happy anniversary. Thank Let you. me ask you, though, has there been any time in that span where either or both of you thought, maybe expressed it, but certainly thought, you know what, this just not work. I'm going to walk. Uh, the, the difficulties are too much. The obstacles are too much to overcome. It's too rocky a journey. Did you ever get to that point in Never. Not for me. I'd, I'd say from the day we first sat under the stars talking for hours, he became my best friend. And nothing that we have ever been through has been enough to want to walk away from that. I feel like it's not... It's not very often in life that people are able to find that best friend that they get to spend their life with. And I have considered myself extremely blessed, no matter what we've been going through, to have found my best friend. One of the points that our Christian counselor made, uh, Gary Nichols, was that a lot of times people don't know how to love, even in a marriage. They confuse love of self with love of the other. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that in your marriage you have that sacrificial love that says, I will sacrifice for the other even when it costs me personally? Absolutely. I think so. I don't think, I know for me, I was, I, I can't really say I'm 100% now. I would like to think I am, but I've never 100% before now had had that feeling like that. But I think there were some times when maybe I would struggle with my own selfish, selfish love. But, you know, time has helped us and the faith has helped us, helped me grow to be able to, to have that. Do, when you look back, love. if you look back at your first marriage, do you think that might have been an issue that perhaps your love was too self-centered? I think so. Uh, on both sides of the street. And here we are, and you feel much differently about each other. Yes. <laughs> and I think you would agree then that that comes from faith, I would assume, correct? Yep. Very much so. That there was a time in your life where you could not love necessarily that way. Is it fair to say then that your growing faith has led you to the point where you can love in a way that's beneficial to the other yeah, person. Very yes. selflessly. I feel like just as a whole, you know, there's there's just a new sense of everything. I feel like it's, I know that that's not, you know, it's very vague, but I feel like since growing closer to God, you know, I, it's, I, have and I'm, I'm far from perfect and you know still consider myself selfish at times but I feel like I have grown so far from my selfishness that you know my 
it, it's kind of like the will thing. My will is, you know, it's it, at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter. You know, I feel like God's will is, is there and that's what, you know, leads me to be able to feel like I can do and say for him, you know, what needs done, no matter what my selfish needs or wants are. One of the things we've also talked about in the, is this section from Ephesians 5, which says, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. What are your feelings about that? I feel like, um, I, I don't know, like I said, you know, he's, he is my best friend. You know, I would do absolutely anything and everything for him. Um, and so I feel like, you know, kind of like in what you said, you know, I, it's, I, would, I would give everything for him. And I imagine you would feel the same Absolutely. towards her. It's, it's like a, I, I don't think I could ever expect to be loved if I could not give that love. I kind of feel the same way, like, you know, I would submit to her. If I ever expected to be submitted to, I would have to be submitting also. So is it is it appropriate to say that you're not the head of the marriage and you're not the head of the marriage, but Jesus is the head of the marriage? Absolutely. I think we've we've grown in that too. Definitely. You know, that was never that was never a uh, a main ideal, but I think the uh, the opportunity was there for it to be. We just hadn't grown in that way for Jesus to be the head of the marriage. The rockiness that you mentioned before mm -hmm. and the difficulty and the challenges, has that brought you closer together? It has. Absolutely. It's Without one, a doubt. It's one of those things. It's I don't think we would be who we are without the rockiness, mm -hmm. without the trouble, without the opportunity to grow together, without the way we feel about it. It's all, every piece of our relationship, the present, the past, and, and the future it plays a part in who we are today. Definitely. I don't think we would be where we are where we are right now without any of it. I don't think if we never had that spiritual growth, if we never grew individually and together towards God, I feel like we would still be, you know, we would be living self selfishly and I feel like, you know, since we have grown towards God, we have absolutely both let go of a lot of selfishness and like he said you know without those hard times without the the struggles that we've had to face you know we would have never I, it's I don't feel like we would have had the the push to grow towards God like we have that's a wonderful example of people being able to come together in Christ as having him at the head of a marriage. But mm -hmm. I'm also curious to get your thoughts on the Bible verse that says, do not yoke yourself mm -hmm. to an unbeliever. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about that? And especially in the context of, can you go into a marriage thinking that you're going to bring the other person mm -hmm. to faith right. and that they're going to follow your example? Right. What do you think about that? Oh, um, very difficult. Very difficult to drag somebody uh, along in your faith because your faith is your faith mm -hmm. and it's faith in Christ, etc. But that's still something that you possess. You cannot infuse it to anybody else. You cannot give it to anybody else. And therefore, uh, to be yoked to an unbeliever is, well, I know plenty of marriages that started out just like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm going to I'm going to bring this my spouse along and actually it worked just the opposite. Mm. Well, one of the oldest sayings about marriage is you can't go into marriage thinking you're going to change the other person. <laughs> and that's nope. that's absolutely true. But God can change. Yes. Them. That doesn't mean we should go in with the expectation that God mm -hmm. will do that, but mm -hmm. God certainly yes. can do that. Absolutely. Okay, great. Our uh, viewer question this week has to do with, well, it's an interesting question, I think. Someone wants to know, why can't our loved ones live forever here on earth? Now, this is mm. 
someone who's obviously gone through some grief and sorrow over the loss of a loved one. Why mm -hmm. can't our loved ones live forever here on earth? As a matter of fact, why can't all of us do that then? Oh, what yeah. do you think? Oh, it would be, in a worldly sense, that would be awesome if our loved ones could, you know, wow, if we could just live forever. But as, as God said with Adam and Eve in the garden, lest they eat from the tree of life and live forever in their sin. And it's just absolutely impossible. Something that I could not imagine living forever in this decrepit body. Oh my, yes. Well, the short answer to the question obviously is sin. Mm -hmm. We can't live forever. Because of sin, our bodies get old and break mm -hmm. down and will eventually die. The bigger question is, as much sorrow and grief and heartache that's caused by sin in this world, mm -hmm. why would you want to live in this body mm -hmm. forever? Mm -hmm. Exactly. We are promised that we will live forever with oh, yeah. Christ in the glory of mm -hmm. heaven. So we do have that. We will live forever, but to, but to want to live in these bodies, mm -hmm. in this sinful world, that's not very attractive to me. Oh, no. Nope. And uh, I'm actually looking forward to the day when <laughs> oh, yes. we can be in the presence of God where there is no sin, mm -hmm. no sorrow, no sickness, no mm -hmm. grief Absolutely. or no death, and, and all of that has been erased. So the short answer is sin. Uh, the longer answer is, you know, why would you, mm -hmm. why would you want that? Mm -hmm. We will be able to see our loved ones again, yep. and, uh, but it will be in the glory of heaven when we will have new, perfect, oh, imperishable, yes. Mm -hmm. lines, as it says in 1 Corinthians 15. Yep. Thank you for that question. If you'd like to send in a question, you can email it to the show, care of my email again. Randy's on the go so much. He he hardly has time to read his emails. He okay. gets so many of them. So just send them to me and we'll, uh, we'll take care of it. Might even get it on a show later. So 44 years of marriage for you and mm -hmm. 32 for me. We look forward to many more. Yep. And we hope that whether you're married or considering marriage, that it's a long and happy and blessed one with Jesus at the center of it, as we have been called to do, to have him be that third strand. Thank you for joining us. For Pastor Randy, I'm Pastor Brad. We look forward to seeing you again on another episode of Spiritual Honesty. Funding for this program has been made in part through a generous donation by Fisher Seeds of Shelbyville, Indiana. Fisher, grow, nourish, thrive.